The first Advent Sunday, there's four Sundays that are in the Advent, and we'll be celebrating three of the four, because the fourth happens to fall on Christmas Eve, and that is a joint service. So we'll be looking at three of those. So the first Sunday is normally one that, is, that reflects our action, good and bad, good and bad. And it is why we call it sometimes Repentance Sunday, Repentance Sunday. But what I'd like for you to do this, this first Advent is for us to, to reflect, to reflect on really what does Advent mean to me? Now, before we get into our text, I'll give you a little bit of background on it. Mary, the mother of Jesus, was with child, of course, Jesus, and was visiting her cousin Elizabeth, who we know she was pregnant at the time with John the Baptist. Upon the arrival, the baby in Elizabeth's womb leaped for joy, because even the life in the womb knew who the Messiah was. So yes, that means that there is life in the womb, that there is life. And Elizabeth acclaimed in uh, Luke 1.45, Blessed is she who has believed that what the Lord has said to her will be accomplished. So this morning, can we exclaim that same, that same thanks, that same giving glory to God, who has said he will be faithful in all things. We're not celebrating or acknowledging the fact of who Mary is. She was just a woman who was used by God to bring forth the child, Jesus. She has no special powers, has no special abilities, has no special connection. And she is not referred to as the mother of God. She's referred to as the mother of Jesus. So we pray in the power of the Holy Spirit, to Jesus, to the Father. So with that said, will you stand with me, please? And let's read all together. Luke chapter 1, verses 46 through 55. Luke chapter 1, verses 46 through 45, 55. Let us begin in one loud voice. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of this servant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me be blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercies is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm, and he has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. And he has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has set away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, and in remembrance of his mercies, as he has spoken to our fathers, to Abraham, and to our offerings." Amen. The word of the Lord from the book of, book of Luke. Please be seated. You know, as we look at this thing, there's a couple of points I want to say with you. Is that, first of all, that did you notice what Mary did in the beginning? The beginning, the first thing she did was to do what? Give glory to God. Give glory to God. And this first Advent is the Advent of hope. Every week has a particular theme, but this week is hope hope. So this is what we call a song of hope. Mary's song. Mary's song. Mary says this. She says that Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. In God my Savior. For he has looked on this humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on all generations will call, will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things, and holy is his name. That one text right there is where a lot of, there is, there is a theology that believes, as you heard me say, that Mary has a special relationship with Jesus. Well, that is true in that sense, because Mary is who? His mother, the mother of Jesus, the human. So as she says in here, People will look on me as I am blessed. Yes, because God called her to carry Jesus. God called her to carry Jesus. The Virgin Mary, as we say. There's no I think, nothing else special that's other than that. There's no miraculous prayers that can be said to her that will just, because she has a special relationship, it's not there. It's not biblically sound. 
The Bible says very clearly is that when we pray, we pray how? In the Spirit to Jesus. That's how we pray. It doesn't say in the Spirit to Mary to Jesus. It doesn't say that. It says quickly, very clearly, in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, to Jesus, who brings it before the Father. I just wanted to make sure we were very clear on that. Mary, you see, was animated by, literally, by Jesus, by Elizabeth's address. And she was also, remember, that she was also, in the entire time of that pregnancy, under the influence of the Holy Spirit. And it just broke, she just broke out in joy and gratitude when she met her cousin, Elizabeth. She knew herself to be a sinner who needed a Savior. Look at that verse, what it says. It says, in my God, my Savior. She knew that she needed a Savior. There's a great song that's a contemporary song. It says, Mary, did you know? Mary, did you know that your child would one day save the world? Mary, did you know that one day you would call him Savior? It's a great song. Listen to the words. She had to rejoice in God and what God was doing through her. Think about this for a moment. Think about this. If you had an angel, if I had an angel come to me in the middle of the night, I would probably have to check my medication, okay? I'll be very seriously. I'd probably say I shouldn't have ate that before I went to bed. But Mary had this angel come to her and says, Behold, you'll be blessed. You'll be blessed. That in itself just, I can't wrap my hand or my mind around it sometimes. She rejoiced in God. And she rejoiced especially in what God was going to do through her. There's two words that we say that is said by the angels very, very common. It says, fear not, fear not. Many times in our own life, I believe that the angels have come to us and have told us in our prayers, fear not, fear not, for the Lord God is with you. Fear not, for the Lord God will always love you. Fear not. For whatever comes this way, whatever the world has to throw at you, I am with you. Fear not. Fear not. In Psalm 103, verse 1, it says this, Praise the Lord, my soul, all my, my innermost being. Praise his holy name. I believe many times that we just give lip service to that. We just give lip service when we say we praise God. We just give lip service when we say, Lord, I praise you with everything that I have. That last song we sang during worship, what was it? What was the last song we sang during our worship time? See? If we really were singing that song, we would know. We would really know that last words that were there. We would really mean everything that was there. Do we truly praise God as to how God wants to be praised? Do we truly stop and say, thank you for the smallest little gifts? Do we praise God? Do I praise God? I ask myself that I'm able to stand up. Yes, I do. Do I praise God that all of you are here? Yes, I do. And when you and I come in contact with the Holy Spirit, and you'll say, well, I don't remember that. Well, yeah, you do, because the Holy Spirit dwells within you if you are a believer in Jesus Christ. When you come in contact with that Holy Spirit and you'll say, well, Pastor, I've never really had the Spirit come out and, and touch me and show me these things. Then you know what? You better get the wax out of your ears. And the wax in the, in the biblical term means get that junk out of your ears. Out of your heart. Because the Holy Spirit is always working in the believer's life every single day. Do you believe that? No, you don't. You're just giving me lip service. No, you don't. Because if you did, there would be no doubt that when we praise the Lord, that when we did things, that it would be from the bottom of our bowels, as the Bible says, all the way from our most inner being. And last night when we were singing that, and excuse me, I almost, I almost said last night, cantina, instead of cantina, I can't even say it now, 
that whatever. <laughs> a couple of times I almost said cantina, and everybody knows what cantina means in Spanish? That means bar. <laughs> I don't think there would have been a good time to say that, right? No, not. But I was just thinking about that when that, when that young lady was singing and her voice was there. I was moved. I was moved to such a point that Pastor Che, who I was sitting next to, who was very lonely, that's why he called me down to sit next to him. He was sitting there, and, and he goes like this. He gives me an elbow. Yeah, Pastor Che gives me an elbow like this. Now, I thought it was my wife for a minute. You know, give me an elbow. And he goes like this. He goes, and I looked at him kind of like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> he was telling me to applaud because I was so involved in that song that she was singing. It just brought me to a point where I just, uh, what do you want to call it? Brain cramp, brain dead, whatever you want to call it. I was just taken, just moved by her voice. But I think about it. when the Spirit touches us, do we respond? We as Baptists are very, very stuffy. I'm not going to get in trouble for saying that. I know that. But who cares? But we are. We do not allow the Holy Spirit to move and to operate in our life. We do not allow the Holy Spirit to manifest itself in our life. We do not allow the Holy Spirit to speak and to share and to joy and to love one another. as how Mary did here. We need to be willing and open to the Spirit of the Lord. We must rejoice with that. We must be willing to proclaim who He is to anyone and everyone that we meet. Everyone and anyone that we meet. How many of you went to a restaurant this week? Don't be afraid. Okay. And did you, when that waitress came, if you went to one of those restaurants, when that waitress came to you and she was taking your order, did you ever think about asking her this particular question? Oh, you ask how you're doing. You see, you exchange all these things, don't you? How are you? We're fine. Can I take your order? All these things like this. But do you really come to that person? You see that waitress that maybe is kind of downcast because everybody's been picking on her all day long or everybody's been doing everything else. Have you ever asked her, is there anything I can pray for you for? Is there anything that I can pray for? See what that waitress or that waiter does when you do that. And maybe even then she says, he or she says, yes, there are these things. Maybe you should ask the next question. Do you know who Jesus is? Do you know who Jesus is? Or if you're afraid to ask that question, ask this question. Let me tell you about my Savior. Let me tell you let me tell you. There's an old song we sing that says, go tell it on the mountain. Go tell it on the mountain. We must be willing to share Jesus anytime, anywhere, to anyone. We must not be ashamed of the gospel. When we say, I'll pray for you, do we just give lip service or do we really pray for that person right then and there? You see, we are in the Advent season, and, and yes, you can say, well, we're giving a lot of attention to Christmas and things like this. It becomes very secular with these Christmas trees and the Christmas lights and all these other things like this. But it is probably one of the most, one of the most, let me rephrase it, it is the primary time that people will be open to hear about the gospel. They will be open to hear because there's no joy in their life. Because there's no hope in their life. Because there's no peace in their life. People will be open to hear the gospel. Be open to hear that gospel. Christmas, I said, this Advent season is the perfect season to give. But to give the greatest gift. The greatest gift is the gift of Christ. The gift of eternal salvation. The gift of sharing the gospel. The gift, the gift that keeps on, quote, giving, as we say. Consider who you might help this year. Consider who you might pray for this year or you might reach. Maybe it's a family member. Maybe it's them. Is there, is there, there is not someone in our lives who could rejoice at the gift 
of Christ today. Mary not only prays God, but confesses that God knows everything about her. You can see this in verse 48 and 49. And we should take a clue from Mary, Mary's words concerning our own actions. This is why the first Sunday of Advent is one that we should reflect on our lives and ask God for forgiveness. Ask God for, forgive me, Lord, for maybe not this past year of not doing the things that I need to do. Forgive me for not sharing. Last night, the theme that we had on the, on the cantina, cantana, was, was in fact, was the fact, is there room? Is there room for Jesus? I preached a message several years ago about, is there room? There's no room at the end. There's no room at the end. And as I was reflecting back on that message, I realized one thing. The one thing that we do not say about the birth of Christ, that Christ was homeless. Christ was homeless. He had no home. Where was he born? In a stable, in a manger. They had no room for them. So when you look at this time, when you see Mary, you can see her soul rejoicing uh, that, that God is with her. And the fact that she bears the Lord Jesus in her womb, the Savior, and that one day who will redeem her and give her joy. She says, my soul glorifies the Lord. Right now, does your soul glorify the Lord? Does it? Or does it glorify the world? Or does it glorify yourself? Does it glorify the Lord? Does your soul cry out to sing praises to God? Sing praises for the one who has paid it all for us. Yes, we really celebrate the resurrection. Yes, we do. But we should also acknowledge the fact that Christ did come. Whether he came on December 25th or not is not the issue. The issue is that he came, and he was, came in the form of a human. To glorify God privately is one thing, but we must show to him, above all, that we glorify him in the corporate or the public place, do we not? Here's my second point. God's mercy is for every single person. Verse 50, and his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. Generation to generation. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. This is a very, very important and a pivotal verse that all of us must hear and must understand. Do you realize that Jesus Christ was born into this world to save all of us, to save you, to save me. That's why he was born. There is no division in races. There is no Korean. There is no Mexican. There is no Hispanic. There, Hispanic, there is no, no black, no Asian, no none of this at all. There is none. There is no diversion, division that is in these verses or economic value. Who has more money? Who doesn't have this? Or social status in heaven? There is none. None at all, because we all fall short of the glory of God. Several years ago, I was preaching in a Russian church. A friend of mine has a, has a Russian church, and uh, he asked me to fill in for him to preach, which I thought was rather strange anyway. And so when I went there and I finished the sermon, he was, he was translating for me. And he turned around and he asked me, he goes, because Pastor Frank, you know what? I said, what? You know what language we'll be speaking in heaven? And I knew he was setting me up. Okay. And he caught, you know, he kind of caught me off guard, but I knew he was setting me up. And I, before I could respond, you know, with a very, you know, one of those zingers, he said, it will be Russian, of course. It will be Russian, of course. And I said, well, we have a problem then. And he goes, what's the problem? I don't speak Russian. And he goes, but you will. 
in that, in that Russian Ashton voice. There will be no such thing. There will be no division of languages. There will be no Korean. There will be no Spanish. There will be no Russian. There will be no Ukrainian. There will be none of this. It will all be a heavenly language that all of us will be able to communicate and glorify God to the fullness. We need to understand that. We need to get over ourselves right now because this life right now is preparing us for heaven. It is. And if we don't prepare now, we're going to be like that poor soldier that's supposed to go in front of that promotion board and doesn't even open a book. And stands in front of that promotion board and they look at him and they say, they ask him his name and he doesn't even know his own name. That's how we're going to be. We need to be there. There's no division. In God's eyes, we were all created in one race. Created for one purpose. To worship him. To worship him. We are commanded to worship over and over again. The Bible says to fear or respect is actually the word that's there. To show him all at all times. Did you notice that phrase generation to generation? Generation to generation. That means your grandchildren. That means your children's children. That means your children's children's children. The heritage, the best thing you and I could ever give to our children, to our grandchildren, or to our children, is not the kick in the pants, but is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is the gospel that will last forever. That is the gift, the greatest gift that is there. To our grandchildren, generation to generation. We as adults... And you may say, well, all my children are growing up. No, we as adults must take time to teach the children. We must take time to pray for the children. We must take time to hold, to protect the children. For the Bible says, generation to generation. And as we do that, we face the wickedness of our own sin. And we will see how God's mercy is there. Romans 5, 8 says this very clearly. But God demonstrated his own love for us while yet while we were still sinners. Christ died for me. Christ died for you. I try to teach this to people. Take that verse that's right there. But God demonstrated his own love for, put your name up there right now. Come on, everybody all together. Wherever it says us or we, put your name in there. Can you do that? It's, it's not a test, okay? Okay? You're not going to pass or fail. Let's do it all together in one loud voice. Put your name where it says us or we. But God demonstrated his own love for in this while Christ died for. If you're not sure about that, see me afterwards. And I will explain that in great detail. Every place you see, we, us, they, Put your name in there and you know that the gospel is meant for you and the gospel is meant to share. Mary exclaimed the mercies of God for everyone that it extends to everyone who hears it. The problem with the world is this. The problem has that some people have heard the gospel, but it's been a perverted version. It hasn't been that simple version of John 3, 16. For God so loved me that he gave his only begotten son, that if Frank believes in him, I'll have eternal life. Simple, simple. This time of the year, there's no better time. And when we go out at 1230 or so to go to those few little houses, there's no better time than to share the gospel. Well, you say, Pastor, I don't have, re I really can't evangelize. Then you know what? I question and you're gonna, you're not, some of you are not going to like what I'm about to say. I question, if you say you cannot evangelize, if you say you cannot share the gospel, if you say you cannot do those things, then I question, I question one thing. Do you really know Jesus? Do you really, really know who Jesus is? And you'll say, Pastor, how dare you question my salvation? I'm not questioning your salvation. I'm questioning your commitment. Because God sent his son to die for you and die for me. And that was a commitment beyond anything else that can be there. Don't be afraid to share the gospel with somebody who might be of a different faith, of a Jewish faith or a Muslim faith. 
Islamic faith. Don't be afraid to share the gospel because we're called to share the gospel. We're not called to make to be worried about if we if we are what's the word I want to use? It's it's kind of like uh, oh user friendly, uh, uh, politically correct. You know, I'm looking at Danny, and Danny's not going to give me those words because he's not politically correct. So. <laughs> Yeah, don't be afraid. So if we say you can't share the gospel, then you've lost your first love. You've lost your first love. The love that Jesus had for you. God demonstrated his own love for us while we yet we were still sinners. Christ died for us. The third service after this, we're going to be going around. And we say, Pastor, how do I declare this? John 3.16 is how you declare it. If you want more, I'll give you more. Revelations 12.11. And they triumphed over by the blood of the Lamb that the word of their testimony, they did not love their lives so much that, as to shrink from death. In other words, they were not afraid to share the gospel. They were not afraid to share. They didn't care what people thought about them. They didn't care if they lost their life. They only cared about one thing sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Sharing the gospel. Once we are willing to declare our, our testimony, we can follow up with so many different verses. Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory. Romans 6, 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Romans 9, verses 9 through 10, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. It is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. Did you notice what it said? Did you notice what it says? It says that if you profess to be a believer in Jesus Christ, you are saved. And if you are saved, then you are called or commanded to go out and go into the world and preach the good news to all of creation. You are called to do that. My third point is this, that God's promises are fulfilled. God's promises are fulfilled. He has shown his strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of his heart. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things. The rich he has sent away empty. He has has helped his servant Israel to remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his offspring forever. Philippians 1.6 says this. If you don't have this written underlined in your Bible, do so now. Philippians 1.6. Being confident of this. Being confident. I am sure that when I die, I will be in heaven. What about you? What about you? Being confident of this, that he who begun a good work in you will carry it on with to completion and the day and day until the Christ, the day of Christ Jesus. Are you confident? Are you confident of that? The Bible says very clear that God is faithful to himself. He cannot or will not or never deceive himself. If he says he's going to do something, he does it. There are many, many examples that in my own life, but in your own life, where God says he's going to do something, he has done something. When God says he's going to bring you through the Murray clay, he's brought you through that. When God says, he says, do not fear, for I am your Lord, your God. Do not fear, for I am with you. He has kept his promise. Has he not? And he always, always will. God is faithful. And we need to be reminded of God's deeds from Mary's words. He has already performed mighty deeds with his arms. Creation that we see around us constantly, especially here in the Northwest. He has removed the rulers from palace places where they shouldn't be. And Isaiah 24, 21 says this, In that day the Lord will punish the powers in heavens above and the kings on earth below. He has lifted up the humble. Consider the thief on the cross. The day Jesus died. Today you will be with me in paradise. He has lifted up the humble. 
He has filled the hungry with good things. In Matthew 5, 6, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. They will be filled. He has helped his servant Israel, the promised land, continuing even today, even in their rebellion. He has continues to provide for them. He is merciful to Abraham's descendants. Are you, are you experiencing God's mercy in your life right now? I am. I am. How about you? Are you experiencing God's mercy? God's mercy can be explained to you very simple, as it was explained to me by my seminary professor. Mercy means this. God can make you burnt toast without butter. Zap you. That's mercy. I don't deserve it. But God gives it to me anyway. His grace. God gives me his mercy by his son Jesus. God gives me his mercy every day. And perhaps this morning something in your heart has been moved or hopefully and something that within you nudges you in the way to say, it says, hey, maybe that pastor is talking about me today. Maybe he's talking about me. Well, I urge you this morning that if God is calling you to do something, do it. Do it. When God calls us into a a ministry, God will call us out of that ministry. When God calls you to do something else, don't avoid him. Because we can be like we're doing in our early bird devotion. It's like Jonah, right? Jonah tried to run away from God, didn't he? He tried everything he could. But he couldn't run away from his disobedience. He couldn't run away from what God was calling him to do. And God is calling you and calling me to go and share the gospel this season. Whether it be the Advent season or Christmas season or the, or the resurrection season, it doesn't make any difference. God is calling us every single day to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. We cannot be ashamed or say, I'll do it when I retire or I'll do it after this. God says to share the gospel now. Now. Even, even, even as you share that gospel, the reaction from that person might be negative. But that's okay. Here's why. It might even affect a relationship. But that's okay. Why? Why? Because you have been obedient to what God has called you to do. And it's God's job, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, to take care of the rest, is it not? So we need to move forward in that. Even Mary, the very mother of Jesus, proclaimed how great God is. Not how great she is. Not how great and wonderful she is but how great the Lord really, really is. And in this Advent season, we need the first Sunday to ask God for forgiveness. Reflect back and say, Lord, if there's things that maybe I haven't done for you, forgive me. I still have time. She magnified the Lord. She humbled herself to His will. When we live our lives like how Mary did, God will reveal himself to us and through us. We must declare God's glory to everyone we come across this season. We can say, Merry Christmas. We can say, Feliz Navidad. We can say, Mili Malika Maka. I hope I said that right again. No, I probably didn't. Gene shaking his head. But you know what I mean. We can say all of the Merry Christmas, but do we really mean God loves you? Can we? Can we do that this season? I believe we can. 
if we really want to see Christ this season, not through Christmas trees, not through poinsettias, not through anything else, but if we really want to see Christ this season, we will see Him in God's holy word. We will see him in his people's voices. We will see him in your, his people's words as they share the gospel of Jesus Christ with those that are homeless, with those that are in need, with those that are in your workplace, with those that are sitting right next to you maybe. That's when we see the true meaning of the Christmas season. And if there's anyone here today that has not received Christ as their Lord and Savior, meet me down here in the aisle and I'll pray with you. And we'll get your name written in the book of heaven. Let's bow our heads. Father God, we thank you, Lord, that your word is clear. And your word, Lord, it was given to us so many times. Father, bless us during this time. And Lord, as we have seen that your servant Mary, Lord, was used for your purpose by the Holy Spirit. We are just so thankful, Father, that she was faithful to you. She was obedient to you. And Father, we thank you for that. But Lord, as we come to this season, this this Advent season of 2017, we seek, Lord, that we can have the courage and the strength to share the gospel. Father, bless us. In Christ's name we say, Amen. Let us all.